So welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Tanner Watt. I'm a Municipal Program Specialist with Local Authority Services. Uh, today we're going to be hearing from Raman Cabra. She's General Counsel for the Canoe Procurement Group of Canada. Uh, she'll be giving a presentation on compliance in cooperative purchasing for municipal governments. Uh, and she'll also be available after the presentation to answer uh, any questions that you have. So the Canoe Procurement Group was launched uh, just over two years ago to help municipalities save time and money on the goods and services that they use every day. Uh, at this point, we have about 200 contracts in 48 different categories that covers everything from paper clips to fire trucks. So with that, we're gonna uh, get started on the presentation. Hello everyone. My name is Raman Cabra and I'm General Counsel with Canoe Procurement Group of Canada. Today, we're here to talk about compliance in cooperative purchasing. Now, domestic trade in Canada operates at a variety of different levels. There's local legislation, which includes directives and policies. There's regional agreements. So for example, the New West Partnership Trade Agreement or the Ontario-Quebec Trade Cooperation Agreement. As well, there's a national agreement governing trade within Canada, and that's the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. For the purpose of this presentation, we're going to focus on the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, but please keep in mind that the local and regional agreements are in play and these pieces are living, growing and evolving. So keep that in mind when, when um, completing com procurement uh, within your organization. So the Canadian Free Trade Agreement came into effect in July of 2017 and it replaced the Agreement on Internal Trade, uh, which governed trade within Canada prior to implementation of the CFTA. Now, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement picked up where the AIT left off. And the, the goal of both agreements has always been to eliminate barriers to free trade. So what happened with the CFTA is that it brought regional, it brought other Canadian jurisdictions in line with the regional agreements that were taking place. So it's more modern and focused on the free movement of goods services, investment, and people between borders. The CFTA um, establishes a more comprehensive and modern framework for internal trade within Canada. And there's a clear set of trade rules that is intended to make it easier for businesses across the country to access opportunities from coast to coast to coast. The signatories for the Canadian Free Trade Agreement are the federal government and the provincial and territorial governments. Responsibility for enforcement of the agreement is on those parties. And ultimately, the goal of the Canadian Free Trade Agreement is to achieve greater value from procurement, um, specifically in this case for government procurement. So what's the big deal with the CFTA? Well, as I mentioned, we're moving in line with the regional agreements. Um, there's less, this agreement is less limited by the competing interests of jurisdictions. The agreement on internal trade did not regulate vast sectors of the Canadian economy. As well, there was a number of limitations from different jurisdictions that made trade a little bit less uh, open and made it difficult to enforce the agreement rigorously. The dispute resolution provisions of the Agreement on Internal Trade were more layered and slow, and the CFTA dispute resolution uh, provisions aim to place more positive requirements on the provinces and territories for enforcement, as well as move the process along more speedily. Now, when we're looking at the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, the, our focus is on the government procurement provisions. And those implement and affect the municipal, regional, or MASH sectors of the economy. So when we're looking at it with respect to government procurement, when we're talking about valuations and procurement thresholds, the thresholds for um, procurement under the Canadian Free Trade Agreement for goods and services are procurement that exceed $121,200. Um, and on the construction side, it's just over $300,000. These values change and um, are adjusted every two years to account for inflation. So that's why there may be some variation from some previous iterations you've, you've noted before. And it's important to note that generally the procurement thresholds under the Canadian Free Trade Agreement are higher than the regional counterparts. So that's where I caution 
uh, review of the regional agreements as well to ensure that procurement is consistent with the trade agreements. When you're valuing uh, whether or not a procurement is um, meeting a threshold or hitting a threshold amount, the valuation process differs under the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. So now when you are valuing uh, procurement thresholds, you need to include taxes, fees, extras, as well as optional renewal years when you're valuing that. So it's not simply the term for which a commitment is made. You want to ensure that you're including any um, additional amounts. And the rules are for government procurement for a governmental purpose of a good or service that's not intended to be resold uh, by any contractual means for the value which exceeds those thresholds. Now, when we talk about the rules, these are the same rules that buying groups need to follow as well as the municipal members. And they're the themes that we're seeing consistently across the country. That's open, transparent, and non-discriminatory access to covered procurement by procuring entities. And so what that means is no favoritism, which refers to treatment that's no less favorable than the best treatment the party would accord to its own local goods and services and suppliers. Um, no avoidance and no circumventing, which refers to preparing, designing, or structuring a procurement process uh, in a way to avoid the obligations of the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. So actions that we've seen in the past regarding that are dividing quantities of goods and services to be procured, diverting funds to entities that would not be covered by the CFTA, or to buying groups designed to avoid the obligations of procurement rules. As well, using options, cancelling procurement, or modifying awarded contracts to circumvent the obligations of the CFTA um, are not permitted. As a procuring entity, for any covered procurement, you're required to post a tender notice or RFP on a provincially designated tendering site. So when we refer to the tender notice or RFP document, there is a number of things that need to be included. Some of those are, are pretty intuitive, but what's, what's important to the Canadian Free Trade Agreement is that it's noted that the procurement would be subject to Chapter 5 of the CFTA as well there needs to be evaluation criteria included. And that includes methods of weighing, um, if that's relevant, if price is not sole criteria, as, and, and any supplier requirements need to be provided in the RFP as well. If there are technical specifications, they can't be used to obstruct trade. So any technical specifications need to be set out in terms of performance and function, rather than specific design or characteristics. When setting a deadline for producing tenders or tender responses, there needs to be a reasonable amount of time. Um, and the Canadian-European trade agreement sets out some time frames for that for higher threshold amounts as well. If there's going to be an allowance for negotiations, um, it needs to be stipulated in the tender notice. Or those can take place if there's no clearly advantageous tender response. Um, and as well, for any buying group, there needs to be a list of participants as well as any potential for expanded procurement. Now, any modifications to the RFP um, or to the requirements of any tender notice responses, all suppliers need to be informed. So it's important to publicly post that. And that in the event that any sort of modification to the RFP requirements require additional time for submissions, that needs to be provided. So we talked about time periods a bit. Um, the CFTA requires reasonable time period for responses. Um, so what you want to consider there is the nature and complexity of the, uh, of the RFP. Um, if any subcontracting is anticipated, you want to include sufficient time to allow for suppliers to respond and, and note any sort of pricing with respect to that. And as well, if there's going to be submissions by non-electronic means, uh, there needs to be time uh, included to allow for that. As I mentioned, if negotiations are going to be permitted, they need, the intention needs to be noted in the RFP document. Um, any sort of eliminations need to be made within, in accordance with the criteria noted in that RFP. And it needs to be noted whether negotiations will be concurrent or consecutive, and the same unfairness and discrimination rules apply to negotiations as well. Now, for standing offers, 
if, if the process is being set up to establish a standing offer, that needs to be noted in the initiation of the competitive process. So it needs to be clear that what's being arranged is a standing arrangement. And what needs to be included to that is how any sort of call-ups or orders will be made. So in instance, with canoe procurement, our standing offers are set up at the discretion of our, of our members and potential future members. So that, that's, um, that, those are the requirements for standing offers. Now, limited tendering or sole sourcing is something that comes up quite a bit. Um, there are instances where limited tendering or direct sourcing is permitted under the agreement. The first, of course, is if there's no submissions or conformity to the requirements of an RFP. Um, another is when there's a specific need for a particular supplier. If there's no reasonable alternative to that, um, limited tendering is available. Unforeseen and emergency circumstances is another instance where limited tendering is available. Um, as well, if any additional goods and services were not included in the initial procurement and for economic or technical reasons, it would be inconvenient or it would require a substantial duplication of costs, limited tendering is permitted in those situations. As well, instances of collusion is a new exception. So if the bids or responses in the procurement process appear to be collusive or are collusive, a procuring entity may choose to engage in a direct award. So other than these exceptions, I note that various regions have schedules that provide additional limited tendering situations. So please note those um, wherever you're located. So awarding a tender. Once the RFP closes, awards need to be made within 72 days of the closing date. If there's any issues with that, there should be a posting to that effect. And any award needs to have compliance with the essential requirements and conditions noted in the RFP. You're required to select the most advantageous um, response. And of course, there's limitations to that if it's not in the public interest, if it involves crime or, or any sort of collusion. Um, as well, there is the ability to verify any abnormally low tender. So it gives... Um, procuring entities uh, a resource there if there is any sort of abnormally, abnormally low tender to verify whether or not that's actually achievable. Transparency is one of the key themes of the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. So when it comes to awards, that, that theme applies as well. So you need to promptly inform uh, of an award. Uh, those are, that notification needs to be in writing on request. And if, if unsuccessful parties require reasons on request, you're required to provide the same. Vendor debriefs are something that was new under the Canadian Free Trade, Trade Agreement as well. If a vendor requests a debrief of the process, you are required to provide that. And as we talked about, the award information needs to be publicized. So some inconsistent actions. These are some specific actions that are noted within the agreement itself. So according to preference for local goods, services, or suppliers, um, that's very key. And I note that there are mechanisms within the trade agreement that allow procuring entities to protect themselves against concerns about um, timing delays or the ability of uh, insurance requirements or the ability to maintain an office in the, in the region. So please take note of that if, if that is a concern for you when issuing an RFP. Scheduling events in a tendering process in order to prevent certain suppliers from submitting tenders. Using price discounts or preferential margins in order to favor, it, favor particular suppliers. Um, limiting participation to only suppliers that have previously been awarded one or more contracts is also something that's newer. Um, requiring prior experience is another inconsistent action unless it's required for that procurement. So for goods and services, for goods, um, procurement of goods, that may not be a requirement. For services, it may well be. So keep in mind when setting requirements that they're absolutely essential for that procurement or that need. Providing information as an advantage to one supplier over other suppliers is another one. Um, if there's modifications or information or inquiries that come in once the RFP has been issued, it's important to post um, any sort of modifications or any sort of information um, to the portal or to the tendering site that you're using so that all suppliers have those responses. 
and of course creating any unnecessary obstacles for participation in procurement. Any sort of conditions for participation need to be necessary for that. And I note that the CFTA does permit exclusions in the, in the event of bankruptcies or insolvencies, false declarations, persistent deficiency in performance, uh, serious crimes, professional misconduct, as well as you know a failure to pay taxes. So when we're talking about cooperative procurement and compliance in cooperative procurement, we're talking about the rules that apply to buying groups um, when they're procuring on behalf of government entities. So for the purpose of the CFTA, the rules that we just discussed are applicable to buying groups as well. Those same rules for no discrimination, no unfairness apply, as well as the need to issue the RFPs and what's required of the same. So I just want to talk about buying groups and cooperative purchasing a little bit more specifically. Now, what is a buying group? A buying group means a group of two or more members that combines the purchasing requirements and activities of the members of the group into one joint procurement process. Buying groups include cooperative arrangements in which indiv individual members administer the procurement function for specific contracts for the group, as well as more formal uh, corporate arrangements in which the buying groups administer procurement for the group members. So depending on those types of groups and how formal the arrangement is, the following rules may vary slightly. Now, buying groups may consist of a variety of entities and can include a combination of procurement entities, public entities, private sector entities, and not-for-profit organizations. But many of the uh, procurement activities that we conduct at Canoe Procurement, um, we carry on as an independent organization, we'd be considered a buying group for the purposes of the CFTA. So, this matters because the CFTA is setting the same positive obligations on buying groups that they do to the procuring entities themselves. So when a procuring entity is participating in a procurement that's conducted through a buying group, they're required to ensure that that procurement is in a manner that's consistent with the general procurement rules that we discussed earlier today but it's on the buying group to per publish a notice of each procurement. That notice, as I indicated before, needs to include the participating entities, as well as outline the potential for other procuring entities to participate in the procurement after the instrument has been put in place. Now, as a procuring entity that's participating in a buying group's processes, you're required to publish a notice of participation with the buying group at least annually on the designated tendering sites that have been set up by your province. That notice is required to direct potential suppliers to the buying group tender notices website, um, specifically if that's different from uh, the province's website, as well um, for the notice of intention that Canoe puts out or recommends to its members, it directs suppliers to our website as well so that all opportunities are noted. And so here's an example of a notice of intention that we've drafted for our members. And essentially it's as simple as this. Noting your municipality name and intention to participate in one or more of the procurements conducted by Canoe Procurement Group of Canada between a one year period. As well, we then direct um, in that notice to the Canoe RFP notices um, as well as the Canoe website. Now, when a procuring entity has little or no control over the procurement process, it's not required to ensure that that procurement is consistent with that chapter. That refers to these more formal arrangements, like when Canoe is uh, undertaking the procurement function on your behalf. Those obligations fall on Canoe. As I mentioned, it's the same themes that apply. So this is a slide that you may have seen in the past. It's noting traditional versus cooperative procurement. And as you can see, um, what pro a cooperative procurement allows is an elimination of a number of steps for you as a procuring entity. Those steps are being undertaken by Canoe. They're not being forgotten, but it does allow this opportunity to skip through steps three to nine um, from the procuring entity itself. So what have we been up to as a group? 
Um, we are constantly reviewing trade legislation and guides across Canada, as well as any sort of amendments or changes to the same. We, have, we meet with officials in each province to review our procedure and processes, and we are constantly updating our RFP templates and contracts to meet the needs of our members, as well as adjust based on how interpretations of the trade agreements um, have taken place. Various factors go into our revisions, and it is, an, it is a balancing act to ensure compliance while ensuring access to the markets for our vendors. So, you know, we look at the growth of the program, we take into account the environment, that's the political environment, as well as various other um, environments that impact our, our users. We look at our processes and we adapt them to make them more functional, um, user-friendly, as well as ensuring that they're complying with changes to trade rules across the country. And as I mentioned, access to the market for our suppliers is important as well. Now, there's potential for change um, within the trade agreements. Um, the CFTA it requires the provinces to engage in exploratory discussions and negotiations um, with relevant ministries, stakeholders, and such to, to discuss the incorporation of these rules to certain exempt industries. So it's possible that there's going to be further expansion of these rules into other industries. As well, um, the dispute resolution um, mechanisms are still underway, and each province is implementing them differently and at different times. So there's potential for change with respect to once the roster of panelists have been completed. As well, you may be hearing that the Government of Canada is implementing an electronic single point of access. That's a requirement under the Canadian-European Trade Agreement, um, and what that ensures is that there's a single point of access for opportunities for government procurement over a certain threshold within Canada. Each province um, is working with their current systems to ensure that these systems will feed into the single point of access. So in the next few months, you'll likely be hearing some changes to the tendering portal websites uh, to allow for this single point of access. As well, Changes in government and policy um, often relate to interpretations of these trade agreements, and so there's potential for change on that front. Experience is something that we've noted at, here, over here at Canoe. Um, you learn as you're growing, um, and uh, that always allows for some change. Um, lawsuits as well have been relevant. Um, specifically, we have seen some outcomes of civil lawsuits um, as against procuring entities with respect to non-compliance with trade rules. So that impacts the interpretation of the trade agreements as well. So there's a lot to consider, um, especially when you have a big reach as we do over here at Canoe. Um, so we need to be able to manage those challenges. Some of those challenges involve the fact that it's a voluntary program. No one, none of our members are committed to a specific volume are required to take part in any of our programs. And so when we're coming up with evaluations and interpreting that, we're not able to guarantee, nor do we guarantee any sort of volumes to our suppliers because we simply cannot. Education with respect to these trade agreements is huge. Um, there's a variety of levels of understanding when it comes to trade agreements as well as procurement rules and so we've been working hard to ensure that this education is available and that we're able to not only assist our members but also the suppliers that we deal with in understanding um, the requirements under these agreements. Now we've conducted as well in-depth reviews and comparisons of, revi uh, of provisions across the country so we want to be able to accommodate continued growth as well, we're confident in our processes and our benefits of our programs. We've had minor challenges in the past, but our processes speak for themselves. And when required to deal with government entities, we've been able to demonstrate that our processes are in line with the compliance rules within trade agreements. Our contracts now are more secure than ever, and that provides security for our members and vendors alike. We want to ensure that there's confidence in our programs. And at the end of the day, it's our position that strong processes result in strong relationships. So we make the changes that are required on your behalf. And I'm sure that as we continue to evolve as an organization and as a buying group, um, there'll be changes going moving forward. 
Some of the requirements may seem insignificant and tedious, but they are necessary. And at Canoe, we want to do what we can to support our members as well as um, participating suppliers in accessing the MASH sector market. Managing compliance with these rules is a huge part of that. So this is just a look at our partners, which helps uh, demonstrate the amount and the reach that Canoe has. And I hope that this seminar has been helpful. Of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Hello, Raman, how are you today? I'm doing well, Tanner, how are you? I'm good, thanks. All right, so we've got a few questions to get us started. Uh, hopefully you're okay being in the hot seat for a little bit. All right, our first question, uh, under the inconsistent actions topic, uh, scheduling of events was noted as not allowable in a tender. Does this exclude a mandatory, does this exclude mandatory site meetings for construction or other projects where contractors are able to review the site to understand the work or propose a solution? Um, there's a few other questions there, but I guess we'll go through them one at a time. Yeah, just to take a look at the, the ones, the follow-up ones as well. Um, let me let you reject this one for a bit. Okay, so with the, in, with this, I think that's referring to the scheduling event section that we talked about. And I think that this would be excluded under that part. That really refers to timing RFP processes to sort of avoid or, or um, make it difficult for certain participants to um, participate. Um, what, what it looks like here with respect to the mandatory site meetings, that seems to be a condition for participation. Um, and it, in the case of construction, that's often a necessary requirement. So I, you know, without knowing any specific details, um, I would say, generally speaking, if it's a specific requirement for participation and it's a condition that needs to be fulfilled in order to provide um, accurate and responsive uh, bids, uh, I would say that that wouldn't fall in the exclusion for scheduling events. That that typically refers to you know times and and um, you know when there's an awareness that there's a busy time or people are away and, and scheduling them in sort of a short time frame to sort of avoid other responses. So something like this seems like this would be required um, as a condition for participation, and it it seems that 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 would be acceptable. Uh, sorry, I can't get too specific because I don't know the exact facts that you're referring to here, but I wouldn't, um, just looking at it, um, the way that the question's been worded, I wouldn't uh, include that in the scheduling um, of RFP events. That really refers to when you're posting and requiring um, responses. Um, with respect to um, disqualifying anybody, that really needs to be clearly laid out in the tender notice. So if it's a mandatory requirement that they do attend, then you know, the, as long as the market's aware of that and as long as potential uh, contractors are aware of that, um, I, I don't see there be any issues for disqualifying them for that. All right, thanks. Um, next question I think I can answer is, will the presentation be made available to participants? Uh, we are recording this and we'll have it posted on uh, the LAS YouTube channel as well as our website and we'll send out a link to everybody uh, attending today uh, shortly after with uh, with where you can find that. Okay, um, don't have any other questions at the moment so while we wait for others uh, to come in um, I will just mention that we will be uh, either myself or Simon or some other either LAS or canoe staff will be attending quite a few conferences this summer. Uh, so if you have any questions at all, feel free to stop by. And we're, all, we're also getting back to doing in-person meetings. Uh, so if you'd be interested in setting up an in-person meeting at your municipality, please uh, let me know. All right, well, not seeing any others, I think we can wrap things up. Uh, if anybody does come up with any questions, feel free to just hit reply on the follow up email that you'll get uh, likely this afternoon, uh, and we can get an answer for you. Uh, if not, thanks to everybody for uh, attending. Um, we've done quite a few of these webinars over the last six months uh, or so. They're all available on our website to check out. Um, thanks for those who've attended more than one. Um, and we'll catch you again when we start this series back up in the fall. Thanks, everybody. Take care.